a number of things are coming together to drive a narrative that we're in an AI bubble today. I saw a conversation just on X last night basically saying the death of AI is near, right? Like we have the prophets of doom out. I want to lay out for you why I think that's happening. And then I want to lay out for you the pieces we're not looking at as a community as we talk about AI. And last but not least, I want to put together a story that I think is more accurate about where we're actually at in AI at the moment. Less hype, more reality. That's what I do. So here are the four things that I think are driving this. Are we in a bubble death of AI narrative? Number one, people need a story. There was a massive story and swing around GPT-5 hype. It was kind of a botched rollout and people need a counter reaction. People need to come back and have a different take now. And so I think the need for narrative swing and narrative drama is part of the challenge here. Number two, reports of layoffs at Meta. So the AI division at Meta was widely reported to be restructuring. There have been cut cutoffs and challenges. Well, that's a part of the layoff narrative, right? That's a part of the AI in trouble narrative. Number three, Sam Altman himself admitted the GPT-5 rollout was botched and infamously said, yes, we're in an AI bubble or there's some elements of an AI bubble in what we're doing. And then number four, around the same time all this was happening, an MIT study came out saying that most enterprise AI projects fail, which is not new. It's, it's yet another study showing that this is a high risk, high reward kind of activity and that organizations really struggle to get it right at the team and above layer, even as we see individual productivity gains. Ironically, a lot of the things that I've been emphasizing are things the MIT study called out like, hey, you need to have the right leadership. You need to have a culture change moment. You need to define a high value use case. I could go on, et cetera, et cetera. But all these four things came together, right? People saw layoffs. They saw that they needed a narrative after GPT-5 was disappointing. They saw Sam saying the word bubble. They saw this thing on enterprise AI studies failing. And it was like, you know what? That's it. That's it. We're done. We're in a bubble. It's over. And so people just kind of swung, the pendulum swung back and the narrative has exploded from there. So I want to suggest to you that a more correct take includes the following five elements or following five facts that we're not really paying attention to. Number one, the chatbot use case is indeed getting saturated. This was reported by Sam in like an interview right after the one where he talked about the bubble. In other words, if you're in the chatbot, you're not necessarily going to see tons of tremendous gains anymore, no matter how smart the model gets, because people don't necessarily perceive the progress in the chatbot because the AI is about as good in the chatbot as it's going to get. So famously, what Sam said in that conversation was chat GPT-6 is coming and memory is going to get better. But really, the chat use case is kind of saturated. I think he's right. I don't think we have a lot more to gain from the chat use case. Number two, I think we're forgetting that progress is moving to agentic and complicated use case, which is sort of a corollary to the chatbot, right? And those use cases are hard for people to understand. I'll give you an example. There was a big conversation on X over the last couple of days around whether GPT-5 Pro did new mathematics when it was assigned a new theorem and did a new proof for something that a human hadn't done. And the consensus seems to be it was new. It was correct. It is a milestone, but it is a different kind of innovation than we get from a human. Humans are good at creativity, intuition, and the models that we have today are good at brute forcing innovation forward. And so it was in a position where it could brute force a series of calculations around a defined problem space and get to a new proof that hadn't been done before, and it did it. And that lines up with what we see in other innovation stories, where we see that these models are very, very good at certain kinds of innovation that really do push the field forward, but they aren't doing the same work as humans. And that nuance often gets lost. And that's a great example of how complex agentic use case analysis is getting and assessment is getting. I don't know the math either. It's hard for people to understand or experience where the progress is. Fact number three that I think is getting forgotten. Progress is demonstrably continuing at exponential rates. We have any benchmark that is not saturated is showing continued strong gains. I think my favorite is METR right now because it just doesn't have a top. All it does is it measures how long a task takes a good human and then it says, can an AI do it 50% of the time? Now, I'm the first one to say 50% is a low bar, but at least it's a consistent bar. And we keep showing exponential gains on that as agentic use cases get stronger. And we're not bottoming out. That's not slowing down. We keep doubling every few months. Number four, we are still under allocated on chips. In the same interviews that got blown up around the world around AI and bubbles, Sam admitted he could release a smarter model, but he lacks the chips to do it. Anthropic is also famously under allocated on chips. Everyone's using them for coding and they just can't get enough chips. They can't do it. 
So in that world, if they're under allocated on chips, it means they sense tremendous demand, which is backed up by what we see from the MIT study. If 95% of orgs are failing at AI, that's 95% of 100% who are desperately trying to get into AI. That's the demand. Ironically, the MIT study was read as reinforcing uselessness when what it should have been read at is reinforcing the insane cost benefit that organizations are running to get AI correct, like they are doing absolutely anything they can to force their way in the door. Fact number five, teams are refocusing now that the path to the next leg of gains is mapped out. I have been in a lot of corporate restructurings. It's very typical once you bring in fancy new talent like Meta has to restructure. And that is exactly what they did. And the path to the next leg of games is around inference. And Meta has grabbed a bunch of people who are good at the next leg of AI computing. And they're just refocusing to do that well. I don't think that's that big a surprise, frankly, but it got fed into the story. So if you put this all together, you get a story of continued progress on high value use cases, continued demand for chips, ironically, continued demand for intelligence backed up by everybody saying they don't have enough chips to serve models, backed up by the MIT study, ironically. So is Sam right? Are we in a bubble? I would actually argue that if he means, are there elements of unfounded hype in AI? Yes, there are, absolutely. Is there froth? Yes. As a wonderful example, again, just from this week, I could pick any number of a dozen examples, but look at the number of lovable copycats out there. How many companies do you know who have put up a little box saying, what do you want to build today? The latest one is Airtable. I would not, I would not think that Airtable should be doing that, but they've decided to. With any gold rush, you get people rushing in to stake a claim where they think there's gold. And Lovable has demonstrated there's gold in vibe coding, and so now there's a rush there, right? And there's going to be a lot of Me Too players. Any time you have value, you have Me Too players. That doesn't mean it's inherently a bubble no matter what. And I think that people sort of over-indexed on that comment, and they thought, well, oh, there's hype players. That means it's a bubble. Let me tell you, I have lived through a bubble. That is not the only element you need for a bubble. I think that one of the things that we should balance out with as we look across like how people got to this narrative, the things that we've forgotten, what Sam might have meant by bubble and what elements are indeed bubbly in the AI narrative, we need to also pay attention to what else is going on. And I think there's, there's two trends that better explain the full story I've been telling than just a bubble. One is AI is demonstrating real value and real use cases, and that is ironically why businesses are leaning in so hard. The story of the 5% isn't getting told, but I've seen it. When organizations get it right, AI is delivering step change gains, it's delivering 10x gains across the business. That is existential. It is worth betting a lot on. It is why the organizations that are failing are going to come back and most of them are going to try again. They can't afford to miss this one. The second one is related to that. We are in a power law game and power law costs and returns show up across AI. That means AI is increasing according to a power law, so it's increasing exponentially. I talked about that. It also means you get power law returns from gambling on AI as a business. And I, gambling is probably the wrong word, betting on AI as a business. Essentially, if you invest in something and there's a power law return, it's rational to invest more than you usually would. And we've seen that pattern play off across companies investing in AI, but also across model makers. Model makers investing a billion dollars in AI talent or whatever it is, as Zuck did. Model makers investing a huge amount in chips. All of that is a way of saying, we think there's disproportionate returns on AI. And we are going to keep investing very, very heavily in order to harvest those returns. Now, I do think one of the things that's shifted in this game is that it's harder and harder to catch up. One of the things that I noticed is that Apple is trying to figure out how to recast their narrative in the last week or two. They need to be seen to be playing in AI. And so they had a big piece that there was a leak. I'm sure it was a leak that was kind of intentional, guys. But it is harder and harder to catch up as we move forward on the AI frontier. And there are fewer and fewer labs that are really seriously playing on the edges of AI. There's OpenAI, there's Anthropic, there's Google, and Meta is trying. And XAI is trying. And other than those, like Amazon has fallen by the wayside. Microsoft has arguably just decided to be in the cloud business and serving AI models business. And that's gone very well, but they're not really doing something separate from open AI right now. And part of the reason for that is that as you get a power law world with AI, you get incredible pressure to specialize and pick your niche because otherwise you're spending a lot of money for nothing. And so ironically, I would argue the fact that we've seen a winnowing out and a narrowing of AI model makers in the last year, it's an argument that people are actually starting to think about how they're allocating capital, which is not something you do in a bubble. And they're starting to be trying to be smart about where they play in this AI world. 
Microsoft wants to sell the picks and shovels. They want to sell the cloud piece. Google wants to sell the cloud piece. I think AWS does as well, although less successfully so far. In a power law world, it pays to invest heavily if you know your niche, which is sort of a large strategic insight that scales all the way out to businesses. Like you have to know your niche to sort of be able to invest carefully, cleverly, and well if you're going to invest that much. But if you know your niche, it is rational to allocate capital heavily. And that's what we see businesses doing. And so when you ladder this together, some froth, you have demonstrated real value on use cases, you have a power law dynamic going on. I think the way I would put it is that we are in a world where model makers are showing exponential gains in model performance. And we are very, very early in seeing how that lands with the business. And that's part of the irony and the challenge right now. In terms of where this sets us up for the rest of the year, listen, I've lived through multiple bubbles. The one thing you never see in a true bubble is people complaining about it being a bubble. If it really was a bubble, we wouldn't all be complaining about it. Instead, we would all be hyping it up. And I think it's really healthy that we're having this conversation. It's healthy that we're asking the question. But when you look at the narrative overall, I don't think it I don't think it adds up to a bubble. I think it adds up to a frothy high capital market where some people don't know where their their niche is and they're over allocating in the wrong spaces. You see some people who are desperately trying to AI wash their products and you see real value. And the real value is so disproportionately helpful to business that people are doing anything to get it. That's a complex story. It's going to become more complex over time. I don't think that we are going to get into a world again where we have immediately obvious chatbot use cases. There are going to be some immediately obvious AI use cases for consumers coming. I don't think it will be in the chatbot. It will be somewhere else. But we're going to increasingly see incredibly valuable business tools come out. And I think we're just at the front end edge of that piece of the AI revolution. I'm excited. I'm curious. I am not worried about an AI winter, uh, and I hope that this has helped you recast some of the overall narrative we're seeing right now.